in our reading, and, they, and they're going to read those in character this morning. That's what I've been told. <laughs> so let me invite you to turn your hearts and your minds as we prepare for Advent. Thank you. Probably not. <laughs> let me see. Give me a second. back and my legs to move quick. Thank you, Mrs. Yeah. Danielle? Oh, okay. Um, and those whom the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. We light this pink candle as a symbol of Christ our joy. May the joyful promise of, our pres of your presence, O oh God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. Thank you. Let's stand and uh, worship this morning. Let's stand together.
this up. Sing. Oh, oh, oh. Again, sing. Sing. Oh, oh, oh. Again, go. Sing. Oh, oh, oh. One more time. Let's go. Sing. Oh. friends, let me invite you to take a seat. And uh, while you're taking your seat, let me encourage you, inside your bulletin, uh, there's an opportunity for you to pull out your Connect card, uh, but also you're able to do this online. Uh, 561-571-8964 is a way for you to connect with us. But uh, if you're using the paper card, 
Uh, here's what we, we're, next Sunday, we will have one worship service. We'll start at 10, 15. Uh, the reason for that is because we are going to have a Christmas party after the service. And it, while I love to have a, multiple parties, it's just a whole lot easier to have one party. And uh, so we will be meeting at 10, 15. Now, if you're here early, you know, at the 9 o'clock time, then I'll just give you a really long sermon. Okay? So just... You want to go ahead and, and mark your calendars now that, uh, hey, I get the extra hours sleep or somewhere in that time frame and uh, join us. Uh, we're looking forward to it being a full family affair. Um, and you'll discover that's one of the things I like to do, especially when I have multiple services. There are different points that I look for ways for us to have a united service uh, where, the, where everybody gets to be together. And uh, um, sometimes, you know, the 9 o'clock folks don't really know the 11 o'clock folks and things like that. So... Uh, I thank you for your adjustment to that. I know that, that that's a change, and nobody likes change except for, I don't know, a, bi a baby, right? That's probably something on the, off the top of my head, you know, thinking about that. So please mark your calendars. Also, I want you to be on the lookout on Wednesday. Uh, you will receive an email from me if we have an email address from you. Uh, that email will have the Zoom link. Uh, for you to join me on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Uh, at that time, I'm going to be sharing with, the, hopefully, a, a good number of folks from the church why I love our budget. Um, and, uh, but really, it's an opportunity for me to cast some vision uh, with you to also have questions. It's not always appropriate for me to take a worship service to talk to you about finances. I know there's a whole book in the Bible about numbers, uh, but I'm going to use a, a Wednesday night uh, to do that. That will be recorded uh, and we'll make that available uh, for folks that were not able to join us. And then hopefully in January, uh, I'll do an in-person to kind of cast that uh, vision again. But uh, I would really love to have folks that are online with me, and there will be an opportunity for question and answer. Uh, I hope it's a good use of your time. I know I'm catching you right for some folks. It's around dinner time, uh, and you're more than welcome to eat your dinner while you're on Zoom with me. Uh, that will be fine. You can just take yourself off video for a little bit while you're, you're, you're eating. And, uh, and we'll definitely ask that you mute so that, you know, never mind. That works well. Also, so, um, hey, I wanted you to know, how many of you were able to see the musical uh, from Wednesday to, Thursday, to fr Saturday? Did they not do a fantastic job? I mean, it was phenomenal. It was certainly, certainly exciting that the church was able to, to bring that back. I want you to be mindful, though, that those folks started practices the end of August. And every Sunday from August until December, they gathered uh, uh, for practices uh, for two, at least two hours every Sunday. There was, there was a break in some. And then once a month, they had a Saturday-Sunday combo where they would gather a Saturday afternoon and be there for three to four hours, and then they would be, come back at Sunday. Uh, all together, just in the practices alone, uh, they, they did volunteered at about 45 hours worth of work. So if you figured out what an actor or an actress makes an hour, and then multiply that by our folks who, who just gave a phenomenal performance, you know, they all did good minus one. That was supposed to be a joke, but that's how my jokes went. <laughs> You're supposed to say, well, which one are you talking about? You know, they all did wonderful. They all did fantastic. Just the guy who had to do the MC we have to work on. But other than that, that was the taste of my, my humor for those that were there. So that reminds me, Matthew, I'm going to need you to edit. Yeah, a whole lot. Hey, uh, so on the 19th, we're going to have a combined service. The 26th, we will also have a combined service. That's mainly just to give some folks a, a, a break. Uh, it's a little hard to you know, do Christmas Eve, Christmas, and, and those kind of things. Um, and then on the 2nd of January, we will have a combined service. We will do uh, the Wesley Covenant Renewal Service. That, so all three of those services will be at 1015. That will be the start time. And then for Christmas Eve, uh, it's our hope. Uh, last, year, last year, we were up in the air, like, how are we going to do Christmas Eve? Do we do it outside? Do we do it inside? And we had it set up outside. And if you remember, we had all this weather system we thought was coming through. And so we moved it inside, and we didn't really tell folks. And yet, without even telling folks that we had made that adjustment, we had a really, a really good-sized folks 
And I was a little bit nervous, to, to be honest with you, about the number of folks that were here. So that just kind of gave me the impression that we, it's good for us to be thinking about two services. And so we will have a service at 5.30 and at 8 o'clock. Both of those services will be a traditional uh, candlelight family service. So I hope that you will uh, make plans. This is a great time to reach out to your community, to your neighbors. Uh, if they don't have a church, just say, hey, why don't you come with me to Christmas Eve? Uh, we promise that it will be uh, a meaningful service. So I hope you'll, you'll make the point to, to be a part of that. So those are the announcements I want to make uh, this morning. Uh, let me invite you now to be in a spirit of prayer with me, especially uh, may we be in prayer for those uh, who have been just devastated and uh, uh, incredibly impacted uh, by the tornadoes. We as a United Methodist Church, I, I meant to share this with you, um, I love the Red Cross. The Red Cross is a wonderful organization. I have done lots of work with the Red Cross. But we in the United Methodist Church have also have an organization that, that responds to these kinds of issues. They are on the ground uh, as we speak, but they, they remain on the ground even after those normal organizations that we're familiar with uh, when they pack up and they move on to the next tragedy. And that's our United Methodist Committee on Relief. And so if you're trying to figure out how can I respond... Uh, that is a way for you to consider uh, a response. If you're doing a check, you can write UMCOR. Uh, if you're doing it online, uh, put UMCOR, and we will make sure that those funds uh, go in that direction. So uh, will you pray with me? Father, we began the worship this morning being reminded that you are our king and you are our Messiah, you're our Redeemer, you're our Savior. You are the one who has said, who has said I want to be with you. And you proved that to us in that stable. You humbled yourself to the point of being born in a manger and suffering and dying on a cross. But that wasn't the end of the story. We, we were reminded in the song that through your power, you rolled away the stone and you rose from the grave. And because you live, we can have hope and we can have faith in the most devastating of times. And Lord, our hearts are aching, our hearts hurt as we think about our brothers and sisters in Kentucky and these other, these other states in Tennessee and Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi, all these states that have been in this path of this horrific storm. Many of us can hear the, the cry of that husband who just wants to find his wife. Lord, that's the cry of our hearts, not only for these families, but it's the cry of our hearts that the people of, of this world who are stumbling on in darkness, who are looking for for someone to see them and someone to hear them and someone to understand them. It's the cry of our hearts, Lord, that they would come to know this Jesus that we talk about. The one who says, my name is Emmanuel. It means I'm with you. Lord, may, may this season of Advent be a time in which people, especially people who are struggling, especially people who who are feeling ill, feel, that are feeling overwhelmed by, by all the different things that life keeps throwing at them. May this be the season that they realize in a very powerful and very real way that you are God with us, that you understand our pain and our suffering, and, and it hurts you as much as it hurts us because that's not what you desire for us. That's not your plan, your purpose for us. Your plan, your hope for us is that we would wear the title that you give to us, beloved sons, beloved daughters, masterpieces. Your hope for us is that we would walk as people who have, who have had that life breathed into us, especially in those moments when we felt overwhelmed, as if we were being suffocated by all the pain and all the sorrow of this world but that your, your breath, your spirit, your Holy Spirit would revive us, would renew us, would call us into a place of love, a 
place of peace and as we've been reminded, a place of joy. And so, Lord, as we offer to you the, the very best of our worship this morning, the very best of who we are, we remember that you provide for us our daily bread. We remember that you lead us not into temptation. We remember that you deliver us from, from evil that comes against us. And we remember that you are the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And so we worship you not only for our sake, but for the sake of those who have yet to know that they are also your beloved sons and beloved daughters. May our worship of you this morning be pleasing and acceptable to your sight and to your hearing. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to stand and continue in our worship.
favor before you take a seat you bet once you uh once you walk across greet one another tell each other how good it is to be in God's house this morning To our family and friends online, we want to say good morning to you, and it's good to be in worship with you as well. You know, as, uh, as the praise team was, our uh, worship team was leading us this morning, uh, especially on the last piece, I was just kind of reflecting um, <laughs> there are times you wonder, what in the world did I do to be so blessed? Uh, I mean, I've got a beautiful wife. Uh, I've got three kids that are awesome. You know, they do. Uh, uh, you know, all of them were involved in the in the production of the of the of the musical, and and more than that, they put up with me. I mean, it's just uh, it's just it is truly humbling. Um, so, and I'm going to tell you, I, I wouldn't be here. It is, this is true without without Jackie. I mean, she has been uh, with me from the very beginning uh, of of my ministry. So, uh, I have you know, Debbie, you were you were commenting about you got to to hear her voice. Well, I I get to I get to hear that voice all the time, and uh, even even there are times when I'm in the middle of a meeting in a Zoom meeting, and I can hear her singing in the house, and and then I'll come down and I say, well, that was nice. Just want you to know, the folks that were listening, they want you to know it was nice too. So, uh, but no, it's it's great. Thanks. So you'll you'll recall that last week uh, I invited we took we we've been looking at uh, at least two two scenes from that musical, uh, the Catering Christmas. And last week I invited us to look at Sarah's question to Grandpa Joe Cook, and now that most of you have seen that, you've got an, a little bit more idea of what I was talking about. When she asked that question, how will I know? And I realized that this was the beginning of the, the great Hallmark setup. Uh, I joked around with some folks uh, yesterday that after I've seen this Hallmark musical four times, uh, I needed to go and watch a football game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I missed it. Uh, but that's the point. So it was a hallmark setup. But I shared with you, it raised a question. How will those Parthian astrologers know when they have found that child, the child that would become the king of the Jews? How, how, how would they know? And we discovered that they were depending upon a star. But King Herod, you remember I said, they came looking for a king, but Herod sent them looking for a Messiah. King Herod, on the other hand, realized that they should be looking for a Messiah. So he consulted, not the astrologers, he, he consulted the religious leaders and then sent them to Bethlehem to search out this would-be Messiah. That was last week. Uh, that, was Ma- that was Matthew's version of that story. This week, I'm looking at the end of the musical. In case you don't know, the, the musical ends with Tony and Sarah being engaged To get married, I I know I may have ruined that for some of you, but I did tell you it was a Hallmark production, so what else would you have expected in that context? In their closing duet to, to each other, Tony says to Sarah, when we first met, you insulted my food. And Sarah responds, well, you were a bit crude. And then I don't know, uh, I thought I saw Gerald, but he, you know, some of you music folks can tell me, is it, was it the chorus or is that called a bridge? Where the, the verse was, I, can, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be than standing right here with you. Is that a bridge or a chorus? Thank you. That's what I wanted to hear. All right. 
Now you know why they didn't let me be in the play or, or, or you know, those kind of things. Or I didn't even try to audition because I have a clue what those things are. But I think it's, I think it's a bridge But because they say it's a, a numerous times. But it's, there, Gerald can help me out. Good morning. So is it a bridge or a chorus? Thank you. All right. Good answer, right? <laughs> so this week, what I'm going to challenge you to consider that bridge, because that's what I'm calling it, or, or both. I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be than, stand, than standing right here with you as we consider just how determined God was to solidify his marriage to humanity. I want you to hear those words in that context. You see, it's important to realize that ever since the day that Adam and, I- and Eve insulted God's food, remember God had placed them in the garden. And God said, listen, you can have all of this, but you can't have this one fruit. And Adam and Eve said, God, everything you have given to us is good, but this fruit looks more delicious. Ever since that moment, God has been saying, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be than standing right here with you. And we're going to discover, at least I hope in this sermon, this, this bridge by looking at a detail that when we, in Luke, that when we read this passage in Luke, there are times that we probably just skim past it because there's names in there that we don't quite understand. There's regions that we don't quite get. And, and who cares about counting people? But I want to suggest this morning that when we look closely at that, we will probably discover, or at least my hope is we will discover, how much God wants us to know that he really is standing right here with us. And so before I read the account, I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, beginning at verse 1. I need to give you just a little bit of some background, some context for Luke, who Luke is. Uh, Traditionally, we understand Luke as a a traveling uh, peer with Paul. And so this writing uh, for Luke is much later than uh, when Jesus was alive on earth. So Luke is, is, is saying, I'm not an eyewitness to these accounts. I'm dependent upon other people's accounts to share with you. Um, but so what that means then is that, is that Luke is what I would, I'm going to term an investigative Christian. And I want to encourage you to become an investigative Christian so Luke would receive these accounts, and he would, he would receive them, but he would ask some other questions along the way. Uh, I want to, because uh, as he would ask those questions, the, those questions would lead him into a deeper study. For us, when we become an investigative Christian, it leads us into a deeper walk with God, and it also leads us into a deeper study of the scriptures in that process. Now, you may not get all your answers, but it does cause you to go deeper, at least that's how I've experienced. Let me kind of share with you, when I knew that I was going to uh, preach on this text, how I began as an investigative Christian. These were some of the questions that I asked. Like, how did Joseph end up in Bethlehem considering he was from Nazareth? Oh, but, you know, we kind of take, we, this is my point, where we kind of just kind of skim over things. But So Joseph had to go to Bethlehem. How did he prove that he was a resident of Bethlehem? Did he like have a passport? Did he have a driver's license? I mean, when we come in to vote, right, we have to show some way that we are residents of the area that we live in. So how did, how did he do that? How did he do that? How did he do that? I'm going to watch the Saints play later on, I guess. I don't know. Never mind. I mean, <laughs> if, if he was... Uh, I, I, the other question I was wondering about is like, did they have like a DMV, like a donkey motors vehicle registration kind of thing? Like, like how would they know? Like if he had stayed in Nazareth and said, I'm here to be counted, how would they know to say to him, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong city, you belong in, in Bethlehem because that's where you're from? He said, no, I, I, I live right here. I, I just was curious, did they have that kind of a sophistication? But Luke needs to get Joseph back to Bethlehem And the census serves as a catalyst. But here's my other question. Does Jesus being born in Bethlehem, does it change who Jesus is? So these were some, this is what I mean by being an investigative Christian as you wrestle with the text, as you read the text. Another question I pondered. 
Now, we're told that Joseph comes from the line of David, right? That means he was, he was in the king's line. If we were living in England and I said, you know, I am from the queen's line, doesn't that mean I get like head of line privileges? Don't I? Aren't there some perks with being associated with that? And, and, and if he's going back to Bethlehem, wouldn't he have had residence that he could have gone and said, hey, I mean, you guys, I, I think you were here. I know what happened in the second service. You know, all of a sudden I had, I had relatives from Pittsburgh that just showed up out of nowhere, right? You got it. Yeah, they, they just showed up. And I didn't say, hey, there's no room at the May household for you. I mean, so doesn't, I mean, wouldn't Joseph had some residence that, Right? Okay, so that's part of that, and likewise, I'm not a lawyer, and I can guarantee you I didn't stay at the Holiday Inn last night, but I'm guessing that if I were to ask Colin, or if I were to ask Denise, or if I were to ask the, uh, Bill if he were here, uh, that you might agree with me, right? If I, and I'm trying to see you guys, if, if the word should is mentioned in a legal document, does that mean there's some wiggle room? Yeah, that's the way I, and so when I read this decree, it says this, that all the empire should be registered. Should sounds optional to me. I mean, I, and so I'm wrestling. Why, so why didn't Joseph exercise that option? He said, well, you, you didn't say I must or I have to. You said I should. And, you know, I took that as meaning that I didn't really have to. I mean, we, we have to be careful like the language we use with our kids, right? If we say you should do your homework. No, we don't say should, do we? We say you will do your homework. Right? Again, my point is good. It is good to be an investigative Christian because it doesn't mean that it weakens your faith, but only enriches your faith. Luke's investigative spirit does not mean that what he has heard and learned from, the, from this point, from these other accounts, are untrustworthy or inaccurate. Rather, for him, there are still lingering questions that make some of the accounts still incomplete for him. The way Jesus' birth has been passed down to him was one of those things. And so we get this little bit of a, of a nuance here. Remember when we read, read in Matthew last week, we're told that Jesus has already been born in Bethlehem. Luke wants to know, well, how did he get to Bethlehem? Why was he in Bethlehem? Keep in mind that Matthew was writing for a Jewish audience. Matthew wanted his Jewish people to persuade his Jewish audience that Jesus was the Messiah. So, G, so Matthew didn't need to talk about how Jesus got to, to Bethlehem. He wanted the Jews to understand that Jesus was a fulfillment of the prophecies. Luke is writing to a Gentile audience. He wants to prove that Jesus is the Messiah because he is a God who does not govern from a high, lofty place like Mount Olympus. Luke wants his, his audience to understand that, that this is a God who understands people, who's in their very midst. And so that's what makes Jesus being born in a stinking stable a bit of a controversy. You see, when you read the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, you, you want to notice that Luke defines a disciple as one who belongs to a community, and, it's, and, and in this, uh, uh, it's a group of, of a community of disciples who are seeking to live as citizens, not of this earthly kingdom, but citizens of God's kingdom. And while they're living as citizens of God's kingdom, they're also navigating living in this earthly kingdom. Luke would be a bit uncomfortable with what we have done with Christianity here in America. You see, in, here in America, we've kind of we've kind of like uh, reduced Christianity to being just Jesus and me. I don't need to be with a fellowship of believers. I can let me go out to the golf course and me and God will just talk and have our fun together. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't talk that way. That's certainly God. In uh, you take a nature hike, you go to the beach. All, God works that way. But God, God created us to be in community. This is what Luke is emphasizing here. Luke's understanding of a disciple actually begins with understanding how Mary and Joseph ended up in Bethlehem. So if you've got your Bibles now, I'm in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and I invite you to hear uh, this text. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census, an enrollment, a, a registration, a counting, should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So Luke gives us some, some specific people to go and look at to get this idea of when all this was happening. 
and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Father, as we continue in this time of teaching and learning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would once again come and serve as our holy translator, our holy interpreter, so that when we receive these words, we will know that they have been anointed by you in a unique and special way that would make sense to each person sitting here. Just as the, the, the fire, the, the tongues of fire fell upon the people gathered on that day of Pentecost. And each one said, how is it that we hear this in our native tongue? May each one of us hear it in a way that penetrates our hearts and our minds. So that collectively we might go forth from this place sharing with those that we love and that we care about and those that we will encounter the good news about you. Help us to hear these words, Lord, not for our own sake, but for the sake of others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we know from Matthew and from Luke, some, some basic facts, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We also know from Matthew and Luke that Jesus ends up being raised in Nazareth. That's why he's called the, the Nazarene. But only Luke tells us why Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the first place. And we're told that a decree, a, a Roman order by Emperor Augustus, was made that all the inhabitants under Roman rule and authority were to be counted. Now that sounds simple enough, but what actually becomes odd is the process for counting. When we hear this, we just kind of skim over that, uh, but we don't realize that there's actually a controversy in this census. Uh, and so I'm going to try and unpack that for you. You see, one, the con conducting a census was not unusual. In fact, uh, it's believed that, well, it's not believed, it's known that Emperor Augustus had actually done three uh, censuses during his reign. And the first one had been conducted in 28 BC. And yet, but we have, well, I'll come back to this, but Luke says this was the first. Now, we know that Jesus wasn't born in 28 BC, but he conducts, uh, uh, the emperor conducts a census in 28 BC, 8 BC, and 14 AD. The census that Luke is referring to, to here is most likely around 8 BC. Now, here's where it gets a little bit interesting is normally when Rome would conduct a census, the persons were not required to travel to another town. They would do a count right in their place where they lived. It's kind of like when we do our census, right? We're not required to travel home. They count where we live, and, and that's how they base all those things on. Instead, Rome would just count the population according to the place one resided. Now, that would make sense. Why would you want to count? So if you, had to, if you had to raise up an army within your city in order to defend, it doesn't do you any good if Nazareth is being attacked, but you've got all your residents going to Bethlehem to be counted, right? They don't, so that's why they would, they would normally have you count in the place that you uh, were residing. This decree goes out that says everyone should be registered. Now, as I've already said, that should word gives us some wiggle room, right? And I've been raising some questions. So if, if, if Joseph hears that everyone should be counted, but there's this other caveat that, that you have to travel to your place of, of origin, why does Joseph travel to Bethlehem? Why doesn't he just stay and be counted in Nazareth? Now, he... he I, if, if it was me, uh, you know, 
if the doctor tells me you need to you need to cut back on chocolate, you know, or he says you should cut back on chocolate, I look for some wiggle room in that. Does that mean I should only eat it six days a week instead of seven? So you should understand a little bit, so you understand how I'm kind of interpreting this, this should here. It means I have a little bit of wiggle room. And if I were Joseph, this is some things I would, I would be saying things like, I set up shop in Nazareth. I'm established in Nazareth. I, I plan to die in Nazareth. If I have to travel to go and be counted, that, that's going to cost me some money. Uh, not only that, uh, I, I can barely scrape enough money together to go and make an offering. And when I do the offering, I, f- I fall in the category of the poor widow's might. I don't have any money per se. Not only that, my, I'm engaged and Mary tells me she's pregnant. Not only on top of that, the trip alone is 110 miles away. One way. And so that would mean that, that at least a minimum, that's seven days of travel... Plus, I'm taking a, 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 this newly engaged person who's, who's pregnant. I'm going to have seven days travel. Then there's seven days. Those are, that's at least 14 days that I'm away from making any money at all. All this to be counted? And I know that they don't really have a good system. They don't have a DMV, a donkey motorized vehicle registration system. Right? So why don't I just hang out in Nazareth. But we know that's not what happened. So why are Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem? We could say that it was to fulfill the prophecy, right? Because that's what Matthew said. It was they were there in Bethlehem and it was a fulfillment of the prophecy. But here's I still I wrestle with I now I'm going to say I wrestle with that. That doesn't mean I don't believe that the prophecy was fulfilled. The prophecy was fulfilled, but here's just again in my investigative Christian mentality I, I, it feels to me, if you just said that, that, it would be like you're trying to force somebody to fit a mold and say, I read this in the Old Testament, and this is one of those reasons. Because here's what we know. There were other babies who were born in Bethlehem. We know this because Matthew tells us that King Herod, because the Magi never returned, so King Herod goes, and what does he do? He takes out all the babies, the male babies, that were two and under. So we know there were other babies, other male babies that were born at that time. Herod thought maybe one of them could be the Messiah. So there has to be something more than just fulfilling the prophet, the prophecy. Now Luke says this registration was the first registration. But I've already told you that Augustine had conducted one prior to this. And what it's believed that the first, conduct, the first registration that he does is down in Egypt. It's a smaller geographical region. And so he's, as you're rolling out this new plan, he's testing everything there. And as the things work well, now he moves beyond the region of Egypt to now the entire empire. So this is the first registration, the first census that is happening throughout the Roman Empire. Luke believed Emperor Augustus was, was doing that. So when Augustus ordered the census to be taken of the entire empire... You know, I don't, they didn't have like email or Facebook, you know, where they just do an instant message. This word of mouth has to come and it's got to take time. And so as you're, as you're getting this word out, you've got to go to your agents and you've got to say, listen, I want you to take a count and, and this is when it's this counts. And so there's all this planning and preparation that has to happen. And there's, there's this time frame in which the census will occur. One of those agents is King Herod. And you'll recall, like I said last week, that King Herod was appointed by the Roman Senate, the Senate to serve as king of the Jews. He was not born into that position. And as the king of Jews, he needed to straddle a fence. On one side, he needed to, to submit to all that was required by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, their primary focus on those that were not born Rome... Uh, was to, to lead the people. So, so King Herod's responsibility was to indoctrinate the Jewish people into the Roman way of life, the Roman culture, the Roman customs, and those kind of things, to make them good Roman citizens. And he was to do all that while maintaining peace and order. Peace and order was of the highest requirement. But at the same time, so that's one fence that Herod's on. The other fence that Herod has to, to be on is he needed to be sensitive to the prejudice and suspicion of the people that he was leading. 
You see, the Jews hated and despised anything that was Roman. They were disgusted by the Roman customs and cultures. The Jews believed that everything about Rome smelled of disrespect and abomination to their God. I mean, they just could not stand anything Roman. If Herod were to introduce anything or force anything against, uh, 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 anything Roman like this registration upon the Jews, insurrection was sure to follow. In fact, when this uh, originally rolled out, 6,000 Pharisees would not participate in this census. Herod knew if there was no insurrection, if there was an insurrection, he would be hated by Augustus and eventually be executed. It turns out, though, that Herod is actually able to walk that line pretty well. He built fortresses throughout the the region of Judea that he was responsible for. Many of the cities that he built, they were built after the Greco-Roman kind of style. He was able to construct temples to the the Roman gods. All efforts to, to help influence Jewish people. But the primary way that he was able to straddle the fence was that he left Jerusalem pretty much as the Jews expected. Not only that, he, he went and he, he uh, rebuilt the temple so that the temple was even more magnificent and larger than it had ever been. And in public, he would follow the Jewish customs and laws, avoiding any, anything that may appear offensive. In fact, when his sister wanted to get married to someone outside of their tradition, he went to the Jewish religious leaders and asked for permission in that. These efforts made Herod quite effective for the empire as king of the Jews. Because he didn't force the Jews to embrace this Roman culture. uh, And at the same time, he maintained good order and discipline. And he did this by doing things that were distinctly uh, um, not nationalistic and not uh, offensive to to the Jews. But when it came time to the registration of the Roman empire... Herod had to appeal to Augustus, telling him that the census that you're going to take would endanger the peace of the kingdom because it would offend the nationalistic pride of the Jewish people. Augustus didn't exempt the Jews from the census, but he did make one concession. And I alluded to it at the beginning of this message. He made a modification. And the modification was uh, meant to maintain peace and order. Herod had convinced Augustus that he could get the Jewish people enrolled if he appealed to their nationalistic pride of the Jewish people. So, for example, we say that we are United States citizens. But we also say things like, I'm a a native Floridian. I might even go as far as to say as I am a a, a native conch, which means that I was born in Key West. I'm I'm, I'm from the Monroe County. Right? And as I share that with you, in effect, what I'm telling you, this is the tribe that I belong to. Right? And so if I'm in Florida and I'm hanging, and forgive me for what I'm about to say, but I'm hanging out with a bunch of folks from New York, right? I have a tendency to say I'm a native of Florida, even though I've lived as a Navy brat all over the place. Right? right? But there's, there's a sense of pride in, in that in that. The Jews had always counted themselves according to their ancestral tribes. Herod understood that all Jews that considered themselves pure Jews would know what tribe they originated from. And a pure Jew would be willing to return to their city of origin to be counted as a matter of national pride. Are you seeing the connection? Okay. Those who were not Jewish or had become Jewish but were not born Jews, would remain in their residence. But the pure Jews would be the ones willing to travel to their place of origin. And while it would be a burden for some Jews, that burden was easily embraced because it was a symbol of nationalistic pride to be identified as a pure Jew. And that is how Mary and Joseph ended up in Bethlehem. Now, I titled this sermon, The Stinking Stable Controversy, but the truth is there really is no controversy. Instead, what we discover or rediscover in that stable is where we originated from. We did not originate from some grand place. We came from dirt. And God breathed life into that dirt. 
You see, when we hear the Christmas story, especially this part about Augustus requiring a census, we must consider what town we would venture to in order to register. And I'm suggesting to us this morning, now it may be tempting for me to say, oh, that means I'm supposed to go to Key West, for that's where I originated from. But that's not where I originated from. No, we all came from a people who lost their home. And as a result, have spent their lives wandering from one place to another. There's nothing spectacular about us until we discover our place of origin is in that stinking stable. And it's in that stinking stable that we hear the words, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be than standing right here with you. It's at the stinking stable that we realize how much God wants us to know that we are loved and because we are loved, we are counted. And when we are counted as his beloved sons and beloved daughters, it is then that we realize that we too, like Joseph, belong to the house and family of David. Which means we now carry the responsibility and the privilege of being a people who become beloved sons and daughters after God's own heart. You see, to live as beloved sons and daughters is to be intentional in our efforts to the world. To be intentional, to say to the world out there, I can't, I can't imagine <laughs> that I'd rather be anywhere else than standing right here with you. It's a matter of Christian pride. And I mean pride in a good way for us to identify our home, our place of origin as that stinking stable. To deny that as a place where we originated would be to make Jesus' birth, his death, his resurrection, and his promised return a conspiracy. For it is at the stinking stable we are brought to life through God's love. And Jesus told us, they'll know where you came from by your love. Will you pray with me? Father, may your love inspire and encourage us to remember That it is at that stable that all of who we are and who we are to become originates from. For it was at the stable that you said, there is nowhere else I would rather be than standing right here with you. May that be our heart song for each other and for our community. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to stand for our closing song.
My friends, <laughs> something happens to us a lot of times when we don't see the words. Some of us are dependent upon the words. We think we have to have the right words to give a message of hope and peace and joy and love. Every time that happens, I'm reminded of St. Francis of Assisi, who was uh, being followed by a, a mentor or someone who wanted to be trained by him and wanted to learn how to preach like him. And St. Francis, at the end of the day, after this person had been following, the guy says, uh, you know, teach me how to preach like you. And he said, uh, let my actions be my words. So as you go from here, don't struggle on trying to figure out what words you need to be saying or singing. Let your actions be your words. And as you are filled with peace and joy and love, the people will know. They'll know what peace and joy and love is because they will see it in you. May you be filled with that love and may you be reminded that there's nowhere else that God would rather be than standing right there beside you. Amen? Amen. Thanks for being here this morning. Have a great week and we'll see you around.